for what is stupid, but unlike him, the stupid in Love Lab is good. I oh, like. Uh, oh my Rico's... god! This. Oh my god! I, okay. 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 This. This scene. <laughs> oh no. This scene. <laughs> This is problematic. <laughs> this show is a little problematic, you know. I can't Hockey believe this show is racist. Problematic. <laughs> okay. So, not too long ago, you might have seen this tweet flying around with an out of context clip from the 2013 Doga Koba show, Love Lab. And there are definitely a few issues at hand here, but before I begin properly, I will mention that over the course of this video, I'm going to be bringing up a few things. I will be spoiling Love Lab for context, and regardless of what is literally one joke, I do recommend the show a lot if cute and funny is your thing, because it's great for both. I'm also going to refer to some subjects and ideas raised in other videos, the ones I'll be referring to directly being Under the Scope's recent Monogatari and Problematic Media video, the Hidamari Sketch and Moe video, Zarya's Sister Krona video, and a handful from Lindsay Ellis including Woke Disney and Mel Brooks. I'll also have several sources, articles, and papers, plus a prior video I'll be referring back to, everything being linked in the description. Now, to break down the tweet, honestly I'm not even sure if they watched the show or not. By the end of episode 1, Anyone would know that despite having an ideal premise for cute lesbians, it's anything but. By episode 8, where the infamous scene takes place, the show had already gotten out of the way that one of the five main characters of the student council already had a boyfriend and introduced two other romantic partners that the show, and more explicitly, manga, would use to go into its romance. Potentials of the premise aside, the fact that it is a hetero show as opposed to Yuri is necessary thematically. The desire of the girls to love is at odds with the rules of their prestigious all-girls academy, which means that in order to have the boyfriends they want, they must challenge the authority in place so that they may do so freely. Homosexuality has not been directly commented on, at least not up to the manga material I've read, but it isn't explicitly against the rules either, and it's not uncommon to see nameless students making heart eyes at the main characters they idealize. Lesbian relationships would not be in opposition of authority, but a sidestep around it, leaning into something already present to avoid challenging the systems in place and dodge around meaningful conflict or change to the traditional norms of the school. So while any framing of the girls in the show as lesbian is worth the raised eyebrow in itself, this setup is also important for the general setting of the show that gives context to why this scene is happening in the first place. Maki has virtually no experience with boys outside of fiction and fantasy and that lack of understanding has given her a warped idea of how romance works. The premise of the show also being a vehicle to both use her lack of understanding for comedy and gradually open her eyes to reality. Her fantasies are often overthought and very over the top, while ultimately based in ignorance due to lack of experience, and this extends to her explorations of love. Maki puts everything into what she does, which lends itself to the humor of the series. This curious desire is eventually put to use as the student council begins to receive anonymous questions from the student body from girls not knowledgeable or secure in themselves or what they know, seeking out the young authority for romantic advice and forcing the only slightly less ignorant girls to put in the work so that they can find a worthwhile answer. And this finally brings us to the aforementioned scene. Nana of the Journalism Club, whose skin is notably darker in the manga, making the connection easier to miss in the anime, asked whether or not boys even like girls with darker skin, and as per the formula, Maki went all in, attempting to emulate girls with darker skin to examine their potential appeal. Her efforts were completely useless to the actual question, and how this is meant to be framed in the story is apparent as soon as Maki is shown to be taking these actions. Riko opens the door to see Maki in makeup posing with Daki. This echoes back to the scene from the first episode in which Riko first discovered Maki's awkward and laughable attempts at trying to learn about love by her lonesome, which in turn means Maki is to be ridiculed right out the gate, and as has become normal by this point, Riko's first response in the scene is to smack her upside the head with a paper fan, the show's recurring shorthand gag for telling off characters on their dumb shit. Sayo has a boyfriend and Riko has more interactions with boys, so they are often the straight men there to rear in the antics of their stupid peers, who are just that, stupid. Though to clarify, Eno and Suzu are not actually wearing makeup in this scene, something else cut out in the clip shared in the tweet. Only Maki is because she's the only one who acts in the most exaggerated manner. They are portrayed like this to draw attention to the subject matter as they give accounts from their older siblings, 
who each had something particular in mind when thinking of dark-skinned girls and gave their preferences. Their takes are also not to be taken too seriously, as Eno's brother is pretty much outright a degenerate loser, and while Suzu's didn't appear in the show outside of a flashback from several years ago, his take is even more extreme, and as it's framed next to Eno's brother, it doesn't exactly leave him in a positive light. Pretty much every character involved in the commentary is framed as stupid and ignorant in their understanding, and none of this is remotely apparent in the 13 second selection from the tweet. Regardless of intent, the tweet is framed in a way to remove or even obfuscate as much context as possible, sharing a shallow surface picture with no regard to what the characters are like, off screen or otherwise, and the full range of responses and explorations to the core question, one originally asked by a girl who's on some level insecure about what makes her different. And this context is needed because how the show handles its material is ultimately how its messages are sent, which at this point should be very clear. These are the stupid actions of ignorant children, trying to learn and understand things in clumsy ways, because they are children, the joke being done at their expense. With that in mind, I do want to discuss some of the ideas brought up in the responses, specifically about comparisons to Blackface and Gongoro, of which this is really evocative of neither. Blackface refers to a practice done by entertainers throughout the late 1800s and early 1900s America, where white actors would portray black characters. These shows spiked in popularity after the Civil War, where tensions were falling but still relatively high. These portrayals would gradually fade away, but not before finding their way into other media like film. Through blackface, white producers, actors, and songwriters could craft portrayals of what is not just a minority population, but an oppressed one, controlling the image of that oppressed people and limiting their new freedoms in entertainment industries they would not have proper access to for years to come. These portrayals would lean into negative stereotypes like ignorance, laziness, or criminality, perpetuating preconceived notions and solidifying persecutions that would justify the continued marginalization of these populations. You'll notice that in her videos on Woke Disney and Mel Brooks, Lindsay Ellis doesn't just say, the crows being coated with black stereotypes is bad, or the racist cowboy is ignorant and stupid, she highlights the white dominated industries behind them, where a dominant race is controlling the popularized image of the non-dominant race. Through both a form of a sort of animated blackface, and a character who is framed as a fool because reality doesn't match the politics fed to him by the media he's familiar with. Blackface isn't just non-black individuals putting on makeup, it's a symbol of a dominant race controlling the representation of the marginalized, something completely different if the context has changed. Gangaro, which can mean burnt black look, tan dark, or even black face, is not a form of racial expression as much as it originates from gender. Gangaro fashion took off in the 90s, inverting fair skin and dark hair with dark skin and light hair to challenge or oppose the conventional standards of beauty that had been pushed for decades. And virtually none of either of these applies to Love Lab except the most basic application of lighter skinned characters wearing makeup to be darker. The soul sister imagery evoked isn't even of blackface racial caricatures, but black performers from a healthier time for entertainment where those groups were able to represent themselves and battle for their rights. Maki's imitation is misguided, but it's also based in what is ultimately a more positive image of the subject matter, and nothing about the scene really pays any mind or calls attention to gongoro or derivative fashions. But I still intend to highlight the importance of context here because yes, media should be viewed critically, but in discussing the scene, I've highlighted two very distinct examples of blackface. One is symbol of racial oppression, expressed to ridicule and belittle the already stigmatized, and the other an expression of beauty in opposition of a homogenous norm. One in favor of the harmful status quo, one pushing away from tired norms, both evoked through the vaguely similar core act of heavy applications of dark makeup. A skin deep observation is just that, and trying to equate the dated practices of a society with actual centuries of slavery and oppression in their history to stupid girls who are punished for being stupid in a culture far removed from that history really just undermines and ignores what it really is that needs to be remembered. Is the emotional response wrong? No. Even if the similarity is shallow, it's still going to be emotionally evocative of the problematic elements even if there's no connection. It's understandable to be put off because of it, but it doesn't become wrong because of the knee-jerk negative responses. No piece of media can be sensitive to every person or even culture. Media has the right to offend. I definitely think this is a conversation that needed to happen at some point. Discussion of media is as important to people as engaging with it in the first place. And that includes the problematic parts. This was the ultimate sentiment of the Under the Scope video on problematic media. Art needs to be critically examined, which was a major sentiment of Zaria's Sister Krona video. However, what ultimately holds back both of these videos, the Under the Scope video in particular, is sadly all too common. I don't see any citations. People need to cite their shit. 
and I'm not asking for anything more than some links in the description, or even just mentions in the video. But a complete absence, I think, is problematic in itself, especially when both videos make one similar claim. Zarya's video at several points insists on the potential harm being done as a result of Krone's portrayal, one evoking the same racial caricatures that would have been prevalent in the same time as Blackface. Zarya claims that this portrayal could cause real harm, insisting that Krone will somehow cause people to view others negatively based on what her character evokes. Not only does she fail to offer any citations to such a claim, but in the video she even points out a number of other black characters in anime, other portrayals that run counter to Krone's depiction, and prevent this one character from creating a holistic view of her race. And that's without mentioning examples from Shonen Jump itself, one the target audience for The Promised Neverland would likely be familiar with. Ending the same year as Promised Neverland started, you have Bleach, with characters such as Yorichi, Yushiro, or Tosen. Boruto and Naruto, taking place in the same setting, would have had the manga for Boruto starting the same year while Naruto's anime was still ongoing. In that world exists Kumo Gakure, many of the characters from that region being black with Killer B even rapping to deliberately call attention to what that fantasy setting portrays, because outside of that one character trait, it's just a matter of design. No holistic stereotyping existing among the various portrayals. These examples from Jump's mega-hits would be much closer to the public consciousness of the readers, even putting aside Western media being imported, all of which would challenge how an individual would come to see a group of people as a result of the single portrayal that is Sister Krone. It's insinuated that harm could come about from her design and character, but this is just assumed as factual, no doubt given if it's even probable, while not even trying to argue how that might be the case. The Under the Scope video is even more baffling through its contradictory points. There's no universal moral code, yet Monogatari's presentation apparently has real-world implications that are a matter of public safety, actively endangering people by existing. Oh yeah, and accusing his audience of having been unknowingly being given harmful beliefs about women because... Take the treatment of female characters in so many harem anime. Like Monogatari. It's naive to think nobody is going to watch that and internalize such attitudes. Not when they self-insert as MC Kuhn negging a bunch of schoolgirls. Like people who watch Monogatari. Who would be watching this video? The claim takes a presumed cause and extrapolates an imagined effect, with no evidence or meaningful link between the two, promoting the vilification of media and deflecting examination away from the actual attitudes and behaviors exhibited by people, instead shifting blame onto art that might reflect those behaviors. One of the examples he shows is Shield Hero, a show where people flock to say how problematic its depiction of slavery is, while others argue that the way the series handles its subject matter ultimately frames the protagonist in the wrong for the actions that he takes. Understanding art and how it's engaged with is something Under the Scope brings up, yet he has nothing backing up his claims that run counter to actual studies and evidence, while also ignoring culture. His observations are at complete odds with the moe culture that's intrinsic and crucial to understanding the aesthetic of anime, one that rejects the real in favor of the unreal. But Under the Scope doesn't recognize these viewpoints directly, because to do so would undermine his own flawed arguments that don't line up with accounts made by actual industry personnel and experts. Without proper context, there is only ignorance. The lack of sources doesn't just hurt the wrongful points in the video, but even the ones I happen to agree with. Yes, we do need to have conversations about problematic media, but why is it necessary, as the lack of sources might imply, to refuse to hear out voices already contributing to the conversation with meaningful points and observations, in particular, those from the country of the media in question? This video is only one part of a conversation, a part that has shut itself off to everything, and as a result, says nothing. Without recognizing the parts of the conversation that have already been said, it refuses to challenge the ethnocentric views of the Western anime community and continues to spread the same misinformation and lies, ultimately forgetting that it is viewing the works of a foreign nation and what that means in regards to discussing it. Even just the opener to Outline of a Theory of Practice, which I haven't gone beyond because I was definitely going above my reading level, was a big help to me in regards to framing discussions of other cultures in which what I know and experience in daily life is not the subject of. Citations aren't there for legitimization or feeling smart about yourself. Without evidence to a claim, it has a right to be dismissed. No, this isn't a field of academia, this is YouTube, but basic rhetoric and intellectual honesty should still be required by anyone with even the least bit of integrity, and expected as the norm by any viewer who has investment in what they are viewing. There's a lot of good and accessible worthwhile reading out there. You can get papers off of academia.edu for free, some books you can even get at your library, or I could just pirate them like you do anime. It's an easily accessible wealth of knowledge and talking points to be used. Showing your work is important. My Pervert Characters video would have benefited from the essay The Return of the Sex Wars by Patrick Galbraith 
in which you covered a much more extreme and explicit topic with voices such as law professor Hiroshi Nakasatomi, feminist Yukari Fujimoto, and dozens of sources from decades worth of discussion, settling on a few points I just happened to stumble into, except with much more concise exploration and observations to boot. These Japanese perspectives bolstered the topics surrounding Japanese media, and I don't think coming from a background of googling film theory and watching consumer reviews is an excuse for YouTubers to not have basic diligence and respect for the topics they cover. Sure, there's a lot we don't have access to because of the language barrier, but that's not an excuse for refusing to put in effort. There is plenty available in English as is, and if you don't want to put in the effort, then just don't make claims that need to be backed up because casual audiences aren't going to be scrutinous of them. A little doubt, and that Love Lab tweet would have never gotten the huge amount of views that it did. I tend to agree with the general points brought up in say, Under the Scope's Monogatari Hiramari sketch videos, Zeru's Sister Krone one, or many of Lindsay Ellis's. But Lindsay differs in that she talks about Western media with a Western lens, and her ability to frame her discussions and give good readings in the material makes me feel like a lot is to be desired when I look back on any tube. Well, except pause and select. Just cite your shit. But the cultural talking points there are actually on Japanese matters like nationalism and isekai. I just see Lindsay as a more relevant comparison due to similar topics being covered. And no, I'm not perfect, but I've discovered my own ignorance more than enough times. For instance, in her videos on Moana and Bright, I was able to learn more about cultural appropriation and coding than random internet discourse ever could show me, helping me to better understand and know the things I don't know. She doesn't claim the problematic aspects as the fault of the art, but explores the context of the culture and systems behind them. Even if I ultimately agree with core points such as cute girls anime and Hidamari sketch are good, how the point is reasoned and framed will be intrinsic to his value as an argument, and citations, perspectives, or voices are part of the conversation and need just as much attention if any meaningful discussion is to be had. And no, not everyone has to be involved in these discussions. If you just want to watch anime, just watch anime and keep your talking points to what you can back up. But somewhere, the discussions do need to be had, and some level of gatekeeping is required to anyone making claims or positing their expertise. And while anyone who doesn't want to talk about these aspects should be free not to talk about them, those that do need scrutiny to their points and reasoning. That goes for any topic, really. Art doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's made by people, for people. And art can serve as a lens to look at the culture of those people. But when the lens to those systems and cultures is ignored as a lens and only viewed as a piece of glass, then simply put, it's not going to reflect or reveal anything. Thank you for watching yet another video. This one was brought to you by my patrons such as Rikafag, Flarboo, Moz, Glugal, Oliver Mort, Luis Segura, and Mohamed Akim. And thank you for watching.